And Lord, as we come to your word, we ask the same, that you would speak to us. And Lord, that you would meet with us. Father, that we would be touched and changed, challenged, convicted, comforted. Whatever it is you would like to do in our hearts this morning, may the soil of our hearts be rich and receptive. And Lord, in my weakness, would you help me to speak words that are honouring and that point us to Christ, that he alone might be glorified in the preaching of his word. Amen. Amen. So you remember Paul has just encouraged the Philippians in their relationships to seek peace and in their anxiety to turn their anxieties to prayer and seek the peace that guards their heart and mind in Christ Jesus and that he has encouraged them that the Lord is near to them and as they dwell on the things that are pleasing to God so they will know the peace of God with them, his very presence with them. And so he's come out of encouraging them these very practical ways to deal with the things of the mind uh, and the Christian life that will bring them peace. And now he continues on a more personal note again, thanking them for a gift. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, because once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but you just lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any And all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well in partnering with me in my hardship. And you know, Philippians, uh, that in the early days of the gospel when I left Macedonia... No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent gifts for my need several times. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the profit that is increasing to your account. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. Are you content? Would you say that is a word that describes your state of mind this morning? That's great. Some of us here, I think, will be able to say an emphatic yes, despite going through some difficult things. Some will say, I am content this morning. Others of us will say, actually, I am not content. I'm not satisfied. My heart is restless. This is what Paul deals with in, in, in the middle of this section. That's why I read the whole section, because you'll see if you look down, Paul starts with, with this kind of, I, I rejoiced in the Lord because once again you renewed your care for me. And we might think, okay, well, remind us, in what way did the Philippians renew their care for Paul? Well, verse 18 tells us that. I've received everything in full. I have an abundance. I am fully supplied. Why? Because I have received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Do you remember Epaphroditus? We looked at him as one of the examples that Paul gives of someone who nearly lost his life for the sake of serving Paul and serving the gospel. Epaphroditus is the man who was tasked by the Philippians with taking their gift of money And travelling all the way from Philippi to Rome, where Paul is under house arrest, he's stuck in prison. 
the Philippians somehow had heard, okay, we've heard Paul is in prison. In fact, we hear that he is awaiting trial. He's not sure whether he's going to live or die. And we're not sure what kind of support Paul is getting in Rome. Whether he's been completely abandoned, whether he has everything that he needs, we just don't know. Paul is our brother. Paul is our gospel partner. We haven't seen him for a little while. We haven't sent anything to him for a little while. Let's gather together what we can. Let's be generous, Philippians. Let's be, let's be open-hearted towards our brother in his time of need. Let's get a gift together. And who will go and take this gift? Epaphroditus says, ah, I can go. I got two months off work. I can go. And so Epaphroditus, no doubt with a couple of bodyguards, carrying this gift of money and blessing from the Philippians to Paul, travels from Philippi in Macedonia by land and by sea. Not exactly sure where Paul might be, perhaps. Realising that when he gets to Rome, it's a big old place. He's going to have to find where Paul is and who might be Paul's enemies, who might try and rob them or take this gift away. But Paul says, hey, your gift made it. Epaphroditus got to me with the gift that you have provided for me. And he says, I tell you what, it was a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing not primarily to me, but to God. And so this is the context that these verses uh, come about in. It's Paul finally getting, and you might say after quite a long while, finally getting to the point where he says, oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks for that gift. In part, I don't think it's just this really, but in part, Philippians is a thank you letter. Remember, Epaphroditus got unwell and the Philippians heard about this and they got worried about him. And then Paul was worried that they were worried. And he says, Look, it's better that I send you back. You stuck around to help me. I've been so blessed by all that you've done, but I'm going to send you back. And this is the letter that came back with Epaphroditus to the Philippians. So Paul is saying, thank you. But when you get a gift and, and you say thank you, it, it, tends to be, it tends to be quite specific for that gift. You gave me 20 pounds, I want to say thank you so much for that 20 pounds. Paul, in, in his thankfulness, it's a, it's, a little, it's a little deeper than that. It's not so much the gift, but what it represents. Their partnership together. Their brotherly and sisterly love for Paul. And so although he says to them in verse 18, I've received it all in full, I've received an abundance, I'm now fully supplied because of your gift. I want for nothing now. But notice also, in verse 11, he starts, I don't say any of this out of need. I don't say this as if I felt like I was in dire need of your gift before it came. And verse 17, a similar idea. Not that I seek the gift, it starts. So Paul is saying thank you for this gift, but at the same time he wants the Philippians somehow to know, look, actually... I wasn't in need in the way that you think. And I, I wasn't seeking a gift from you, even though you were so kind to give me one. If you heard about the, the dire situation I was in, if you heard about the problems I was facing, those messages didn't come to you in order that you might give me a gift. But, you did well, he says in verse 14. You did well by partnering me with me in my hardship. Don't get me wrong, I'm not ungrateful. You haven't made a mistake. You haven't done a bad thing by raising this gift and bringing it to me. You've done a beautiful thing. You did well because you partnered with me in my hardship. And that for Paul, I think, is what's truly valuable for him. It's not so much the gift. They could have bought, I don't know what the equivalent of money is. They could have bought him 50 pounds in a gift card to the local corner shop <clears throat> or they could have bought him £5,000 or £50,000 enough to sustain him in ministry for the rest of his life however long that would be but no he says it's not the gift that I was seeking 
And it's not that really which I'm truly grateful for. It's what it represents. Your partnership with me, your love for me. But also he says, don't be discouraged because I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm grateful for all of this. He says, your gift in verse 18 to God was a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. God is pleased with your gift. It has brought him delight. He smelt it. It was a fragrant offering. God smelt the gift you gave me, and he loved it. It reminded him of, of, of melting chocolate. <laughs> I like that. It was an acceptable sacrifice that you've made. You've done well, Philippians. And so this is the context. He's talking about this gift and his gratitude. But in the middle, in the verses we're going to concentrate on this morning... He takes a little digression from verse 11 through to 13. And, and there, the, the verses we're going to concentrate on this morning. So having been reminded then of, of the context, the situation that Paul is writing this in, he's been given this gift by the Philippians. Hear these words again. I don't say any of this out of need. It says, because I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. So thank you for your gift. Your partnership means a lot, but I've learned to be content. And he goes into a little bit more detail. I know how to make do with little. If I haven't got much, I, I can cope with that. And I know how to make do with a lot. Because Paul's not saying he's never had plenty. He said, there are times when I've had loads and I know how to deal with that as well. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Isn't that a secret some of us would like to learn? Isn't that something we would like to know? How to be content? Well, he gives us the answer. He doesn't keep it a secret, a mystery. He says that whether I'm well fed, whether my belly's full, or whether I've gone without food for so long, I, I'm starting to starve. Whether I have an abundance more than I need or whether I'm truly in need and don't have enough to get by. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And I believe that's the secret, as it were, that Paul is talking about here. The lesson that he's learnt. I am able to do, verse 13, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Whatever my external situation, whatever circumstances I find myself in, I know the secret of being content. Are you content? Have you learned the lesson that Paul learned? Have you discovered the, the secret, the mystery of being content as Paul had discovered it? This is not some... Gnostic secret over there that you've got to attain some spiritual enlightenment before the door opens up and you see the spiritual mystery. He, he doesn't mean that. He's just saying, look, I think he's saying this is something that seems so little known in our world. The secret of contentment. That it's as if it's a, a valuable prize contained in a treasure chest waiting to be discovered. And I've discovered it and I want to share it with you, he says. I think in our world, contentment, satisfaction with our lot, with our situation, with what we have or don't have, with our circumstances, I think in our culture it's elusive. If we look around us, the people we know, our families, our friends, maybe ourselves, there's a, a lack of contentment in this world. It's that lack of contentment that drives consumerism, isn't it? A lack of contentment that drives a desire to get more things and to get a nicer car and a bigger house. It's that lack of contentment that drives us to w want to be more famous or influential. To hit that goal. When I get that goal, then I'll be happy. When I attain this, when I have this, when I reach this, when I've acquired this, when I'm better from this illness. 
then I will be content. I think that's the mindset of many of us and most of the world. And I would be lying if I didn't say that often I battle with this sense of discontentment. I think we all do at some point and to some degree, if we're honest. Other we'd be able to say with the hymn writers, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I need nothing else. Or hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life. All I have is Christ. Or to be able to say, whatever my lot, I will say it is well with my soul. Or blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. When I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Not just on the mountaintops, not just when all is well with the world, will I say, oh, well, God is good and I'm content. But even in the wilderness, whatever my lot, I will say, I'm content. And so this is the problem that addresses our culture. Your friends and family who don't know Jesus, I guarantee you one of their biggest battles, whether they've articulated it like this or not, is that they are discontent and they are looking for contentment. And Paul says, I know the answer. And so at the very least, we should pay attention because it is something that we can bring to those who are discontent in this world. Whether they choose to listen or accept or believe is another matter. I think Paul is writing to the Philippians and therefore this also addresses a need in the church as well. The fact that Paul had to learn this means there was a time where he hadn't learned it. Where it wasn't so easy for him to be content. We sometimes think of Paul as this glowing, saintly, uh, you know, never, never got anything wrong, never struggled in life despite all that he went through. Not like that at all. Through trial after trial after trial after challenge after threat after fear after flogging after shipwreck after beating after imprisonment. Paul says, I'm learning it. I think I've got it now, guys. I think I've learned it, the secret of being content. And within the church, as I say, I think there's not necessarily a clearer sense of contentment than there is in the world. It might even be that your discontentment is, is related to church. If only church was more like this. If only there were more people. If only we had more money. If only the sermons were shorter. If only, whatever your discontentment is, it may be something to do with an aspect of your faith. In that sense, perhaps we're not so dissimilar from the world. Who here is truly content? Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, and we come back to these verses in a, in a, in a future session, but he says, reminds Timothy, look, talking about contentment, he says, for we brought nothing into this world. You had nothing when you were born. Brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with these. Paul says, if I've got those very basics, something to put in my mouth to fill me and something to cover my body and keep me warm, that's fine. I'm content with that. The reality is that I think Paul sometimes found himself in situations where he had neither of those things. And he says, I could still be content even then. But when writing to Timothy, he says that if we have food, clothing, we can be content with those. And then he draws attention to the opposite side of this, perhaps. But those who want to be rich, those who think their contentment and their satisfaction and their happiness is going to come in what they own and what they gather and what they earn. Those who want to be rich fall into temptation a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and far from being content and satisfied, they have pierced themselves with many griefs. 
So he says, or the writer to the Hebrews says, some people think that's Paul, others don't. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied, be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Isn't that far more valuable? Not what change I've got in my pocket, but the God of the universe says, I'll never leave you and I'll never abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid, no matter what my circumstances, no matter what I face, no matter what I have to endure, no matter what I go through, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? God himself is my helper and he has promised not to leave me, not to forsake me, not to forget about me. If the Lord is truly my helper and if he has truly made these promises to me, then I can be satisfied with what I have today or what I don't have today. Because it's actually not about those things at all, it's about him. So the question, I guess, then really is not only are you content, but what are you content in or what are you content with? Because if you are content today because you have a nice house and you can turn the heating on and you've got a good meal waiting for you when you get home, if you're content today because you're in relatively good health and your children are happy and healthy. If you're content today because you have a holiday book for July and, and that's what's keeping you going and, and that's your satisfaction, your contentment. Then I need not remind you that today the oven could break and your food will be cold. <laughs> I could remind you today that your house could be burnt down. I could remind you today that your flights might be cancelled and your hotel might close. I can remind you today that you may get ill and your children may get ill. What's the source of your contentment? What are you truly finding your contentment in? What is, what is feeding that sense of satisfaction and happiness? Because if all of those things fell away, if you found yourself without a home and without a holiday and estranged from your family, could you still say, whatever my lot has taught me to say, it is well with my soul. I am content. I, I don't know if I can stand here to, today and say, in all truthfulness, I could feel utterly content if all those things that I value so dearly fell away and were lost to me. That's a big challenge to me from these verses. The secret, Paul says, of his contentment is not in things that will pass and fade and die, but in Jesus Christ, Amen. who will never fail, who lives and reigns eternally. In yes. Jesus is all Paul's assurance, is all his confidence, is all his satisfaction. So the question, as I say, is not so much then, are you content? But where does your satisfaction lie? In what are you content? And if that thing fell away today or tomorrow, where would it leave you? Paul is encouraging the Philippians and reminding us today there is only one unfailing, unending source of contentment and satisfaction and it is not in this earth. It is the Lord. And so that's, I think, why he can say with such confidence, look, in anything, in any and all circumstances, whatever I face. I don't think he's saying, look, I won't be phased by it. I won't be upset by it or disappointed by it. That somehow magically I won't feel the hunger when I go without food. But he's saying that my source of true satisfaction and contentment isn't in that. So I can survive those times. Indeed, maybe if I didn't survive those times even, I wouldn't believe that the Lord had failed me. I wouldn't believe that he had left me or abandoned me. 
So he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly when Epaphroditus came with your gift. Notice even there in verse 10, the source of his rejoicing, his peace, his joy is not in the gift. It's not in the fact that he finally heard from the Philippians after a long gap. I rejoiced in the Lord. Immediately when I received your gift, my thankfulness went upwards. It was God I was thankful to. It was because he is the one I trust for all my provision, to meet all my needs, no matter what. And Paul said he sat in prison. He doesn't know where his next meal is coming from. You think of some of the things he's already told the Philippians. There are people out there who are, who are preaching against Paul, even while they preach Christ. They're doing him down. He has suffered in tremendous ways. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because you renewed your care for me. That the word renewed, it, it, it's almost like the picture of a, um, of a flower blossoming. You, know, you look out in the garden at this time of year and you look at your trees and your bushes and you think, wow, that is an unimpressive display of twigs. But it won't be too long, will it, before the leaves start to come back and the flowers start to open up and blossom. He says, it felt like I went through a period of winter. I knew that you cared for me. I knew that you were concerned for me, but I wasn't experiencing the blossom of that. I wasn't experiencing all the beauty and the goodness of that. But your, your, your care for me has blossomed once more. And he says to them, I, I know this, you were in fact concerned about me. I never for one moment thought that you weren't. But I know you just lacked the opportunity to show it. But now you've given me this gift. I'm so encouraged, I'm so blessed, I'm so thankful to the Lord. But remember, I don't say this out of need. And the Philippians might say, well, Paul, but you were in prison. We know that you were in great need. He says, no, I'm not saying thank you to you for your gift out of need. For I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. How often are we the opposite of content in the circumstances that we find ourselves what does that look like? The opposite of content or discontentment can look like envy, coveting what other people have, thinking, well, how come they deserve that and I don't? Bitterness, I'm cleverer than them, how come they've got that job? Or I'm smarter than them, or if only I was well, I'd be able to do that. Self-pity. Is an evidence, isn't it, of discontentment? Oh, poor me. What did I do to deserve this? Come on, everyone, let me tell you how hard my life is. Gather round. We're all guilty of that sometimes, aren't we? But it's not an attractive thing. In fact, it's evidence of discontentment. It leads to a life of deep and torturous unrest. Even when something does start to go well for you, even when something does turn around, if your heart has been consumed with envy and anxiety and bitterness, you think, oh, I, you lack the ability even to be grateful for that little turnaround. This deep unrest that comes with discontentment, an unshakable feeling of, God's let me down. I deserve better. I deserve more. God owes me. Maybe those thoughts come more quickly to your mind than gratitude to God for all he has done for you. Verse 12, Paul goes on, I, I know how to make do with little. I've been in that situation, he says. I've been there where I've, you know, my clothes are tattered and falling off me. I've got no money. I'm in, I'm in chains. I'm on a boat being delivered to prison in another country. I know how to make do in that situation. And equally, I know how to make do with a lot. I've been in times of abundance and blessing. I've been in great fellowship with friends. We've been feasting and laughing and celebrating. And we've seen hundreds come to faith in Jesus. And we've baptized them. And the church is flourishing. And, 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 and I just feel the joy of it all, of serving Jesus in this world. Paul says, I know how to make do with a lot as well. Not to let that go to my head. Not to let my contentment be found in those temporary things. 
Rather, in any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret. So I hope this is, I hope the answer to this question is obvious, but do these verses mean that God doesn't care about our comfort? That he doesn't care about our families or our health or our material needs? Surely the answer is no to that. We know that God made us physical people. We know that God, well, we, we, we read the words of Jesus last week. That assurance that don't worry about what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. The pagans worry about those things. Your heavenly father knows what you need. But what was Jesus' emphasis? God does care about those things. He knows what you need. He will provide for you. But seek first the kingdom of God. Again, what's your priority? What's the first thing? Where will your contentment and your satisfaction truly lie? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. So Paul says, I I go to him first. The one who knows all my needs. Who does provide for me. And hey, look Philippians, he did provide for me with the gift that you gave me. And so that's pleasing to him. Because you've obeyed him. And you've made him look great. I care about God first and foremost, he says. So I've learned this secret of being content, whether I'm well fed, whether I'm hungry, whether I'm in abundance or need. And so we come to this secret. He's not unique or privileged in discovering this. Rather, I think through the things he's had to endure, he's seen God come through again and again. When all else in this world fails, he's seen the one constant. And this should be the same for every Christian. I'm able to do, verse 13, all things, all things through him who strengthens me. I am able to do all things. Now, you might read that and think, Paul, are you saying that somehow this secret involves how great you are? your ability. The the word does indicate that he's talking about being self-sufficient. I'm able to do this. I'm able to face every condition. I'm able to know joy in every trial. There is nothing that I, Paul the Apostle, cannot face. I am able to do this. I am strong to do this. I have the power to do all things. How often we misread and misapply this verse. How often have you maybe heard this proclaimed from the front? Hey, people, if only you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, you can do anything you set your heart to. You can get that car, that house, that job, that wife, that husband, that health situation. You can get all of these things. If you have learned the same mysterious secret that Paul has, I can do all things. Isn't that exactly the opposite of what Paul is saying here? Paul is saying, when I have nothing, I am still content and satisfied not to chase after those things. Health and wealth and temporary things of this world. But my treasures are in heaven. So I'm able to do all things. Can't mean I'm able to overcome my situation and become healthy and wealthy and successful and prominent and popular and rather when I face these deeply traumatic troubling painful grief filled times I'm able to face them I'm able to endure them I'm able to go through them like I'm walking through the the fire or through the waters. And you might think, well, what's so special about you, Paul? And the point is, he's saying, actually, no, nothing special about me. Not actually in my own strength am I able to do these things, but through him, through Christ who strengthens me. It is only because of Jesus that I can say I'm content even in these awful situations that I don't want to be in and no right-minded person would want to be in. But through Christ, I can endure. I can face them. I am united with Christ. I am one with him. He is my brother. My righteousness is found only in him. He will never leave me nor forsake me. 
when I found myself in the darkest dungeon, in the deepest pit, alone and starving and naked, even there the Lord has not abandoned me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can face every situation because I have Christ. How many of us here can say with the certainty of Paul this morning that no matter what comes to us in this life, we can endure it not in our own strength, not in our own self-sufficiency, but because we are so close to Jesus. We so seek our, our, our energy and our focus and our passion and our ability to endure in him. So don't misquote verse 13 as if it's some kind of victory cry for getting whatever you want in this world. Remember where Paul is when he writes this. And remember, it is actually a sustaining, almost weeping cry to endure in your darkest moment. I can face this with Christ. Jesus is Paul's source of strength here. Does this mean that we don't seek to change our situation, by the way? That if you're in a dark, hard, troubling situation... Does it mean we're meant to be like martyrs and have this miserable life? I don't think so. I think if there is a way for you to change your situation for the better that doesn't dishonour God or hurt other people, then you can make your way out of that. If you can't get that job because you haven't got that qualification, then there is nothing in Scripture that says, hey, you can't go for that qualification and get that job. Feel free to do that under the sovereignty of God. But there are things in our lives that we can't change, aren't there? Our health. It's very hard for us to change our health. And in Paul's day, without the wonders of modern medicine, it was even harder. When we lose someone that we love, we can't change that situation. A deeply dark and grief-filled situation. We, we feel powerless in those times.
and change, God often uses those times. In fact, I would go as far as saying he always uses those times for his glory. And so you remember Paul saying, look, don't be discouraged about the fact that you've heard that I'm in prison. I'm in prison because of Christ, because I've preached Christ, and now because this is where he's put me. And he says, what does it matter what other people say about me or what other people think? I'm content. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Paul says, my imprisonment has been such that now the gospel has spread even as far as Caesar's palace. Every guard that I've had and every friend of every guard that I've had knows the reason that I'm in prison is Jesus Christ. If I was, you know, laughing it up on a beach somewhere, none of those people would have heard the gospel. And so God takes even my darkest circumstance, my imprisonment, and he uses it for his glory. It is not wasted, and therefore, what does it matter? I'm content. The challenge, I think, for us is to consider in our own hearts and in our own Christian walk how much Christ truly means to us. That Paul could say to the Philippians, everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, not despite my faith in him, because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things. And I consider them as done so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Friends, I think this is the secret of contentment in a nutshell, is that we reach a point where we can say we consider all things lost for the sake of knowing Christ. We consider all things to be, to be done in comparison to knowing him and being known by him. I think this is a huge claim. I think this is a huge challenge. Amongst the many challenges that we can take from our time in Philippians, I think this is the biggie. Is Christ everything to you? So much so that you can say, no matter what I face, no matter what I lose, no matter what I endure, I am content. I can face whatever I need to face through him who strengthens me. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So a few thoughts to close then for ourselves. Paul has talked in this letter about maturity. That those of us who are mature think this way. The goal is in heaven. It is Christ. And God will help you, he says, those who don't see this yet. God will help you to grow in maturity. And so if you're struggling today to truly believe that that this could be true that you could so know Jesus and so put all your hope in him that, that you could be content no matter what you face, then your prayer this morning might be, Lord, help me to grow. Help me to grow in maturity as a Christian. Help me to know you better, trust you more, to see your work more uh, evidenced in my life, to spend time in your word and get to know you to be seeking prayer and support from my brothers and sisters to help me mature and grow. Remember, Paul says this is something he learnt. It didn't come to him like a lightning bolt, just like anyone else. He grew in his faith in Jesus. To be able to say we're content as Christians then is a sign of maturity. Saying, I think this is a fight. I think this is an absolute battle I don't believe that we're meant to come out of this building this morning and go, oh, well, all I need to do, put my faith in Christ and I'll be content in all things. Right, okay, what's next? I think this is a day-to-day, sometimes a minute-to-minute battle to say, no, 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 I'm not going to be drained and, and, and worn and ruined by the circumstances that I'm going through. I'm not going to be tempted into envy or covetousness or bitterness or jealousy or self-pity. When I sense those things rising up in me, that's the fight right there. 
the flesh and the spirit. That's why I need to say, Lord, I'm so sorry. and I want to come back to you in prayer. Uh, I want to be content in this situation. Lord, I would love it if you changed this situation. Don't get me wrong. But Lord, while I'm in it, help me to see how you are using it for your glory. Help me to endure it. Let me know that you are with me. This is a fight. Some of you fight this fight day after day. I don't understand how a world gets by enduring the things that people have to endure without Christ in their lives. What do they turn to to endure? Nothing that truly lasts. Nothing that truly brings contentment. We have Christ, and yes, how often do we give up on the fight? And we don't pray. We don't seek him. So this is a sign of maturity as we grow, as we learn. And it's a fight that we should be standing firm together in, encouraging one another in. Last thing, I think. If I'm content, discontent in anything, if I'm dissatisfied with anything, then I want it to be my discontentment. I want to see the areas of my life where I'm not satisfied in Christ and I want to kill those things, <laughs> you know? I want them out of my life. If there is anything that causes me to be dissatisfied with Christ, discontent, then that's what I want to be discontent with. That's what I want to work at and have out of my life. That's, I think, a, what some people call a holy discontentment. I'm discontent because I want to see more of Jesus in my life. I don't see enough of him. I'm discontent because I want to see more people come to faith in him and discover him. That's why I'm discontent. I'm discontent because I want to see the church grow and it's not growing fast enough. I'm discontent because I want, I want to see people mature in Christ. I'm discontent because, because this world needs Jesus and and I don't see it receiving him and responding to him yet. They're the things that I want to be discontent in. So maybe this morning, just looking at these verses, considering Paul's big claim here, the big claim, I think, in Philippians. That if we want this joy that Paul talks about, if we want this peace that Paul talks about, if we want this contentment, it is only through Christ. And if you're discontent today, we'll pray about that now. The answer is not the things of this world. Remember your heavenly citizen. Remember that to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You will be with him forever. Seek first the things that will last. The righteousness of God, treasures in heaven. And let's encourage one another in doing those things. So let's pray. Lord, Lord, I pray this morning that you would expose our discontentment if and wherever it lies within our hearts. Lord, that you would draw it to the surface that we might be discontent with our discontentment. Lord, that it might show us our deep need of Christ. That it might prompt us to turn to him and see him in his beauty, see him in his humility at Calvary, see him in his glory on the cross, see him in his resurrection power, see him in his reigning authority and know that this is the same Christ who will reign forever, who promises us, I'll never leave you or forsake you. My peace I leave with you. Not like the world gives, but a peace that will remain and go deep. And Lord, as you bring up in us those areas of discontentment, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to surrender them before you as we see the wonder of Jesus. that we would find all our contentment in him. 
that all our joy and peace and satisfaction will be in the one who died for us.